Hello and welcome to another Open Democracy podcast. This is Tony Curzon Price and this recording was made on Friday the 15th of June 2012. This is a new experiment in my podcasting. What I'm doing is trying to have a conversation with a generalist, not an expert, someone who can um, fill in the gaps of my own knowledge. And in this particular case of Greek history, I've had a very strong sense that I don't really know enough about uh, how the Greek nation has come to be, and that I need actually some uh, background historical culture to be filled in. And my thought in doing this was to go to someone with an excellent generalist historical uh, knowledge and not to the Greek uh, uh, specialist who's going to take for granted much more than in my case and possibly in your case they should. And I therefore turned to Terence Mitchison, who is a generalist historian, uh, has been a lawyer for uh, much of his career in London, and uh, I can think of no one better to try this experiment with. So here goes, and make sure to tell me what you think of it. You can email me at tony at curzon.com, or of course comment at Open Democracy. We're all utterly fascinated and glued, uh, not only by the soap opera aspect, the, the, you know, what's going to happen in uh, the elections, uh, uh, but it seems to me, you know, but also genuinely in trying to understand how any country, a country like Greece in this particular Greece in this particular case, uh, what it means to become to be a member of to be part of Europe, uh, what it means to be Greek. All these are questions which are difficult questions and huge questions. But it seems to me that we should all have a um, we should all try to have a better understanding and sense of. Let me yes. let me launch into this by. Uh, so one of the one of the really good pieces that we published on Open Democracy, it's now some time ago. It was in September 2010, uh, in the in the early days of the Greek crisis. It's a piece by Aristos Doxiadis, who's uh, uh, who's who's based in Athens, who's a professional in 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 Athens, has been has been an academic in various places, and it was it was a very it was a it, I thought an fascinating piece. I encourage you to go and read it. It's called The Real Greek Economy, Owners, Rentiers and Opportunists. And it was a, it was a, um, it was a description of the state of the Greek economy. It was a real eye-opener to me because it had a real understanding of uh, the economic structure of Greek society and it was very unexpected. And it not only was that, but it also went back and tried to explain the structure of the Greek economy today um, with reference to various Historical roots. So, um, uh, and and in fact, in that in that uh, one of the one of the observations in that article was an observation about land ownership and land ownership structure and the fact that there's actually very little medium sized or large sized uh, manufacturing industry in Greece. And uh, uh, Aristos brings that back to land ownership structures as they emerged. Out of in the nineteenth century, out of the Ottoman Empire. So maybe that's a place that we could start. We can go back and we can go forward from there. But that nineteenth century history, we you know again, schoolboy schoolboy history, but history memory of history says eighteen thirty two, the Greek nation is born. Uh, it's yes, never indeed. it's never yes. so simple. So, Terence, that, uh, yeah. certainly that particular article was very perceptive and uh, uh, shall we say very honest and very candid. Um, I think about. Uh, uh, Greek history and the effect which both history and geography have had on the current Greek economy. As you say, um, if we look back to the origins of the modern Greek state, um, what we have, of course, is the Ottoman Empire in the, um, from the 15th century, from the fall of Byzantium in the uh, uh, mid-15th century, right through to the early 19th century when there are first stirrings of Greek independence. Um, of course, the way uh, British people tend to relate to that is rather to see it through uh, Lord Byron's eyes, the, um, the, the romantic the, hero of, yes, um, yes. of the Philhellene movement, um, his sort of tragic... Uh, Death during the course of the Greek War of Independence, and, and this uh, and, and this rather this rather interesting thing, it seems to me, from the from the British perspective, which it seems to me that, that is still there in many ways, which is that Phil Helene movement is sort of you know buying into a myth, isn't it? It's not really buying into the reality of Greece in the early nineteenth century. It's buying into the thought that it's buying into fourth century BC Greece. 
it's it's exactly it's, so. it's the Greece yes. of ruins. It's not the Greece of 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 you know people are speaking Turkish at the time in in uh, uh, in the Peloponnese. There, you know, the, the, the Greece for that 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 Phil Hellene movement is entirely a romantic construction, isn't it? I think very largely it is. It's probably the fact that many of the British aristocrats would have gone on the ground tour to Italy, suddenly find they can't go because of the Napoleonic Wars. They get diverted to Greece, uh, have probably a sort of slightly scary experience, uh, but they trip around the various um, temple sites um, you know, in the midst of a country um, that's scarcely um, ever peaceful, simmering unrest, brigandage, etc. And um, uh, you know, they're very aware of the past. There is impressive classical monuments. But at the same time, there's a sort of terrible contrast, I suppose, between um, you know, the remembered um, school classics, the wonderful uh, um, you know, reading of... Uh, uh, Homer. Yes, uh, Homer exactly, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and the current pitiful reality, etc. Of the sort of very impoverished country being oppressed by the Turks. There's an element of sort of you know romantic outrage about all this. You know, oh, the Greece might still be free, etc. And, and can you speak a little bit to this oppression by the Turks? Because uh, because you know at least one impression we have of the Ottoman Empire is, is a is a truly multicultural empire is one in which the the orthodox church is 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 has it has independence it's it's aut, aut, autocephalous i think they yes, they, I mean, they call it uh, yes i think um, the, the are, shall we say you know both the very positive and the very negative um, views of the ottoman empire i think most people are um, well aware that the, it was the most uh, you know, tremendous as well, superpower of its day in the uh, 15th and particularly the 16th century under Suleiman the Magnificent, in a way one of the most civilised states in Europe. Uh, I think the easiest way to characterise uh, the Ottoman Empire is that it works very well and benevolently for the settled areas, um, the areas that are part of the Ottoman heartland where taxation is relatively light and uh, people, even the Christians or non-Muslims, are treated with rel- relative leniency. Um, the problem is really that it's essentially a fighting machine. Um, the assumption is that the warriors of the edge uh, are going to behave quite ruthlessly, live off the land, loot and pillage where they are, and indeed they do. But talk, like talk a little bit about the geography here and, and, and the geography of the Western Ottoman Empire, because the Balkans, the Balkans are that border. We usually think of Greece as really being in the uh, Eastern Balkans, and therefore not being on that frontier uh, is is Greece really uh, so so and let's say you know not only Greece but actually all those uh, 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 Christian populations in the Black Sea the Romanians etc. Th- this this forms a, a what one feel I mean is it is it really of uh, uh, the front line of battle of um, Ottoman expansion or is it actually one step back from that front line? I think the truth is most of the time. Um, um, there's quite a lot of Greece that is, um, shall we say, a little remote from the front line, but there's an awful lot of Greece that is coastal, um, and also an awful lot of Greece that is subject to the continued conflicts that go on between essentially the Venetians, um, the great maritime power that effectively uh, lost out to the Turks with the fall of Constantinople. Um, they, they were the great trading power that had this grip on the eastern Mediterranean, and indeed previously the Black Sea. Uh, uh, their great commercial trading empire is sort of cut into by the Ottoman Empire and uh, effectively squeezed as hard as possible. So this continuous war uh, goes on really from uh, the 15th century uh, you know, almost up to the uh, uh, beginnings of Greece in the 19th century. Right, and so piracy is a real problem in, in, in this part it, it of the world. Indeed, though, right? The Venetian Republic yeah. is extinguished by Napoleon in 1797, but uh, up to then, basically, you have the Venetians in what are called the Ionian Islands, familiar to most people as Corfu and uh, Kefalonia, on the, um, the western uh, Ionian side of Greece. Um, but probably less well realised is that um, the Venetians hung on to Cyprus until quite um, uh, late in the um, uh, 17th century, and indeed to Crete um, and uh, various other islands, and quite a lot of the Greek mainland as well. So there were continuous um, uh, episodes of fighting going on um, through these centuries. Of course, the thing that most people um, are well aware of is that um, uh, the Acropolis, the sort of wonderful Greek um, classical um, uh, temple standing above Athens, um, had effectively been treated by the Ottomans simply as a place in which to leave their ammunition. Um, the Venetians turn up um, in the exchange of fire, um, a Venetian cannonball um, lands in the uh, Acropolis attempting to destroy the 
uh, a Turkish arsenal, and of course the whole thing goes up, and the middle of the Acropolis is blown to pieces, and they're still trying to stick the thing back today. Right, and and it's a memorable casualty. <laughs> <laughs> of course, of course, Athens, Athens is 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 only has at that time is a sort of impoverished place that only has its classical uh, monuments to speak for it, isn't it? I mean, it's it's not even a major trading city at the time. Yes. Uh, hardly anything happens in Athens. It's just literally, as it were, an encampment really around the um, classical remains, and um, you know, those who did turn up and uh, uh, as it were noticed what was going. They all tended to record it as being sort of impoverished and pitiful. Of course, later on you have um, Lord Elgin turning up and seeing the uh, incredibly um, damaged state of the remaining memorial, the fact that the Turks and uh, local um, builders were simply sort of stripping bits off the Parthenon. He decides to intervene, um, give permission effectively to take the uh, Elgin marbles uh, back to London, you know, partly with a view to um, saving them for posterity and partly with a view, uh, slightly more commercially, of selling them to the British Museum, which eventually he persuades Parliament to fork up the money to repay him his costs and makes a little profit out of it. <laughs> <laughs> good, <laughs> but, good, uh, good, good, good for him, yes. Yeah. Well, I will, yes. Yeah. Quite possibly the Parthenon would be uh, lost entirely or a large part of the uh, wonderful um, marbles uh, could easily have been destroyed. Um, and, uh, you know, that was at a moment just before the... Um, Greek War of um, Independence, which really starts in 1814 and goes on for another um, 16 or so years. Just before we go, I mean, obviously we need to we need to move on, but before we do, I, I do it, one thing that, that struck me, and which it seems to me is important to note, um, or at least struck me as being rather rather interesting in in the modern context, is that the is is Ottoman administration of uh, of Christian of Orthodox of its Orthodox Christian populations essentially. The the um, the head of the church the w- was was given um, uh, the, the 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 patriarch was given a tax collection target wasn't he and somehow or other he had to raise it from the Christ- um, Christians I mean it, the, the, there's there are at least echoes of uh, the troika's demands today aren't there which is look we don't really mind how you do this but you've got to raise this money very considerable powers in terms of um, uh, civil and family jurisdiction over the um, the Christian, i.e. the Greek population in Greece and of course over uh, orthodox subjects throughout the, the, the Balkans. Um, there's also, I think, um, a sort of group of people who are generally known as the Phanariots from the uh, particular district in uh, Constantinople who are largely um, Greek, uh, highly educated, intelligent people who got to work the Ottoman system and uh, they find themselves um, posts throughout the Ottoman establishment. The Turks do the fighting, the Phanariots very often, and the people at the top of the civil administration. Um, and so the Greeks in positions of control throughout the Ottoman Empire, um, and you know, many of them think that it's only a matter of time for these sort of uh, uh, well, the lazy warrior Turks essentially um, you know, give way to something that is far more controlled by the Greeks. And of course the origins of the Greek War of Independence start with uh, uh, a Greek Phanariot called um, uh, Ypsilantis, who gets what he supposes is some Russian nod or wink to start a rebellion in what is now Romania. That all fizzles out, the Tsar disowns him, but uh, very shortly afterwards there's the uh, uh, um, main rebellion in Greece itself, since it's in Peloponnese. But, um, uh, sorry, that side steps your question, which is really about, I suppose, the, um, the question of Taxation. Well, taxation and also the foreign power, the foreign power's involvement in that, and 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 the the, the, the sense that that uh, you know, in some ways, uh, in, in this case, the authority of the church, which was the which was the identity, which carried the identity of not at the time Greeks but Christian Ottomans, the um, the identity of the church, that the relationship of the church, that the church was a tax raising authority, but not an autonomous one, one that the, where, where that tax raising was was imposed from outside. Yes, that's absolutely right. And to a large extent, I think the Turks thought that um, they had co-opted the Orthodox Church and its patriarch and its uh, establishment hierarchy um, to uh, help them run as well the civil affairs of uh, their empire. And to a large extent, they were successful in this. I think the problem, um, and to a, to a large extent, obviously, with, with the uh, Phanariots and the other aspects of the uh, civil administration of the Ottoman Empire, um, a great many Greeks were, if you like, sort of complicit in working with the Ottomans in uh, running uh, a system which was, frankly, fairly uh, arbitrary in many ways. 
um, there were you know, quite ruthless exactions, taxes, basically, if you found the villagers who uh, seemed to be reasonably prosperous, it was quite likely that they were going to be um, squeezed and coerced in a fairly arbitrary way to um, pay their taxes and whatever the tax collectors could can, grab. Can, can, can you... The pot. Um, and of course, you know, the Ottoman Empire is not unique in that, but it probably carries on in a fairly arbitrary way. Um, well into the 19th century when other people perhaps are uh, becoming a little more uh, bureaucratic, civilised and orderly in their administration. And, and can, you, can you speak a little bit of, and, and again I'm, I, I'm a little bit confused over, I, I'm having a little bit dif- difficulty uh, identifying groups here, but, and I suppose partly it's what language they speak. Is there, is there a Greek language that is generally spoken by uh, uh, Christian Ottomans, by traders in, in, Greek, sit- in Greek cities? Uh, is, is that is it a linguistic identity? Is it a religious identity? What is you know, what, what is what is Greekness uh, in the Ottoman Empire? Does it exist? Is it simply the same as being Christian, being Orthodox no, Christian? I, what I, is I it? Think you, you make a very valid point. I think it's not the same as being Christian. I think what we have is uh, a quite well established identity for the uh, the Orthodox believers. Um, now the Orthodox believers are uh, people who live in. Um, so the Balkans, which is modern Greece, um, Serbia, Bulgaria, Romania, um, obviously the sort of boundaries of um, uh, Orthodox Christendom sort of run up against the Catholic countries, yes. which are essentially sort of you know, you know, uh, bits of Bosnia, Croatia, Hungary, etc. Uh, um, and of course, there are a large number of Orthodox um, believers. Most, in fact, uh, are going to be outside in Russia, in the domains of the Tsar, what is now Russia, the Ukraine, Belarus, all under the, uh, um, the Tsarist Empire at that stage. Um, there are also a great many, but we look at these sort of, so that's the sort of religious divide. Yes. Um, and in fact, I mean, just as a note, they actually called themselves Rooms, didn't they? They were Romans. It was the Roman Empire. Yes, they they didn't call them themselves Greeks at all. Well, I suppose the perception was that um, Greece and Byzantium was the legitimate heir of Rome. Rome. The Roman Empire yes. had, of course, been um, split by Constantine back in um, you know, roughly sort of 300. And uh, Constantine built Constantinople, which was the new Rome. And uh, that as well, was the capital of the Roman Empire. It was the, you know, the, the base for future Roman civilization politically and uh, to a considerable extent culturally. The Western Roman Empire, of course, fell to the Goths, um, disappeared in the 5th century, and the Byzantine Empire lasted for another thousand years. So um, the, the Greeks had some justice, I suppose, for seeing themselves as the heirs of Rome. Um, but of course, this was quite distinct in a way from the religious issue, um, where, uh, although Orthodox and Catholic Christianity started out on very much um, you know, some of the theological lines, there had been a whole series of differences, partly to do with the relative importance of the uh, um, patriarchates, the sort of uh, the main seats of bishops. Um, the, the Bishop of Rome obviously thought he had, you know, yes. he was the heir of St. Yes. Peter and um, had primacy. This was not accepted by the Eastern Church. There were other, slightly more condite um, splits due to uh, things about the, the the doctrine of procession, whether you have a precise relationship of uh, uh, the father to the son. Yes, well, yes, so the philo... The, the, the filioque the, the filioque the filioque all of those yes, things. Yes, yes, yes. But uh, I think this is this is taking us taking us a long way, but but I'm, I still... I do have this... <laughs> I, do, I do have this question of the identity of... What is this... Is there a linguistic identity, for example? Uh, well, uh, there is certainly a Greek language, or perhaps sort of various versions of the Greek language, but there are people who speak Greek um, throughout a large part of the Ottoman Empire, um, and that they're not merely in um, uh, what we now call Greece. Uh, they're very often scattered through the Balkans. A lot of these people, um, the Phanariots and uh, other traders who are certainly present in, uh, uh, as a minority, a probably privileged minority, in uh, the northern parts of the Balkans, Bulgaria, Syria. And, and, and Asia, Asia Minor, presumably, or throughout Asia, Asia Minor. Minor to yeah. a very large extent. Yeah. There are large uh, settlements of Greeks, as it were, in Asia Minor, um, or the city of Izmir, was called Smyrna before. Uh, and uh, right around the coast of Turkey, and also in um, uh, what is now um, Syria, um, Lebanon, right. and Palestine, and a very large Greek community in Alexandria, perhaps yes. a third of the population of Alexandria in Egypt, which was then part of the Ottoman Empire. And then, of course, the Black Sea as well. There are many Black Sea ports. And, 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 would... and I mean, yes. effectively, uh, the, the Greeks spread right around the um, Ottoman Empire, and they had been there probably before the Ottoman Empire. They continued, effectively, to flourish as traders, 
um, under the Ottoman Empire. In many ways, the Ottoman Empire was very good for the development of uh, uh, Greek commerce, seafaring, um, uh, overseas trade, and a very vibrant commercial community, um, uh, linked by language, linked by religion, linked by a sort of common conception of um, Hellenism. But probably nobody could quite define exactly what it was. And, and that language is um, a close relative of the modern Greek spoken in the streets today, is it? Well, yes, I think the, the Demotic Greek, the Demotic E, as it were, um, probably evolved. It wasn't very much a written language that later became so in the 19th century. Um, there were attempts during the 19th century, as um, the modern Greek state evolved, to uh, use what was called the Katharavusa, the purified Greek language, which was thought to be a little closer to uh, uh, classical Greece. And um, there was um, you know, some... Uh, shall we say, sort of, you know, conflict or confusion about the attempt to impose a Katharavuza version um, on the official administration. Which, which was an elite, became an elite uh, mark of being a past it, it elite. It became a sort of, exactly, uh, elite language. And the uh, moment when, um, uh, I think, the, uh, uh, somebody actually published the New Testament in the Demotic version, I think around 1901, uh, and attempted to um, use this, uh, there were actually riots in the streets of Athens. Um, you know, it was actually... <laughs> A contentious issue. Uh, people were uh, using the Demotic Greek, but it somehow didn't quite have respectability until um, uh, considerably later. Right. Okay. So I think I'm now clearer on what we mean by, um, uh, as it were, Greeks before the formation of the Greek nation in 1832. <laughs> yes. At least a little bit clearer. It's, what it, we have. It, it's a dispersed. It's a dispersed community. It's trading. It actually lives under several. Uh, um, it's not exclusively Ottoman, presumably. I mean, it goes up the Danube and there will be uh, in that front-line zone, which is sometimes Ottoman, sometimes not. Yes, that's right. And there are uh, Greek communities, of course, in many other cities in um, Italy, France, Western yes, Europe. Vienna, Greece, Vienna, for example, yes, I think. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. yes. yes, And, and in uh, Venice, for example. And, uh, for example, the um, Ionian Islands, which are quite significant for Greek independence, uh, obviously they are essentially Greek. Um, Venetian administered, um, some of the population become Catholic, um, you know, some like um, you know, a very important figure, um, the Count of Cappadistrias, uh, he's somebody who his family probably originally come from the Istrian peninsula under Venice, um, but is a, a kind of a, a minor nobleman in Corfu. Um, he has a very illustrious career as um, kind of senior minister of the, uh, the Tsar, Tsar Alexander, and performs a kind of important role in linking sort of Russia into the um, struggle for Greek independence. And he's perhaps a sort of rather interesting um, figure in showing, I suppose, the cosmopolitan nature, um, the openness to external influences, the involvement of other powers uh, in what essentially becomes a great... Um, so let, let's, let, let's go back, let's, let's go back to that independence, that moment of independence, because that war, again, this is not 1848, this precedes 1848, it's not... It's it's not the birth, it's not the spring of the nations. Um, it's actually, uh, would you agree that it's a sort of, um, it's to an extent a foreign power construction and creation? Um, to an extent, I think what you have to bear in mind is probably that um, the impact of the Napoleonic Wars and the Enlightenment um, comes to Greece, but it comes to Greece a little bit late. And there are a number of intellectuals who are sort of powerfully influenced, some of them living in Austria, um, and somehow or other, there is some cooperation between these people outside, um, uh, merchants and um, as well the more influential citizens in the Peloponnese and in central Greece, um, and also a link up with, uh, shall we say, frankly, more disreputable forces, people like the uh, so-called Cleftes, the uh, brigand chieftains who um, live in the mountains, rarely submit to Ottoman authority, and are to some extent living by um, brigandage and looting. Uh, all these elements gradually coalesce. There are instances of oppression which um, actually um, you know, help forge resistance against the Turks um, and there's a, a, an organisation I think that's sort of um, um, basically sort of founded abroad but which spreads um, through Greece um, that uh, actually um, develops a conspiracy to um, uh, have this sort of coordinated revolution in several Greek towns and cities. So there is a kind of revolutionary master plan Right, and and that is that is a, a that, um, that that is an, a sort of you, you'd characterize that as being a, a nationalist 
is is it is it a, a sort of precursor of eighteen forty eight? Is it a nationalist movement, a nationalist democratic movement, or would you characterize it as being something else, as being uh, part of this uh, 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 philo Helene uh, uh, movement? What what I, I mean? Yeah. I think what you'd have to characterize as something that uh, meant slightly different things to a lot of people. People's motives for joining in, I think, were enormously varied. Um, uh, in the case of people like uh, Cavadistrias, the um, um, who in many ways was one of the leading figures. He is probably uh, an idealist, somebody who would clearly have had a very successful career anywhere else, but feels this you know, attachment to what is not even exactly um, in a purely his native country. Uh, he doesn't even sort of view it from the point of view of a, a Corfiot, um citizen, but he has this idealistic view that you know Greece uh, could rise and be a civilized power. Uh, essentially, and um, is this Republican? Or is, I mean, because one of the one of the striking things that happens is precisely that the outcome is not a republic, despite it being at the. Yes, I think the thing is that uh, actually, to begin with, many of the people involved are essentially revolting against local oppression. They don't necessarily see that they're going to create a fully independent and absolutely sovereign Greek state. So I think the idea that there is necessarily um, you know a fixed idea of complete Greek independence is. Um, uh, it's wrong. There is an attempt to react to a, a quite oppressive and arbitrary um, government. Um, quite often the people uh, who I suppose are oppressive may not necessarily be ethnic Turks. They could be the, uh, uh, the church authorities or the so-called uh, um, uh, sort of village headmen who are often Greeks but acting effectively yes. as uh, tax collectors or administrators, administrators for the, uh, the Turkish emperors. So um, you would have a, a reaction against misgovernment, uh, an aim to create a, at least an autonomous state, um, something where there's you know, perhaps a, a more opportunity to end particular sorts of oppression, right. kind of um, you know, particular concerns, I suppose, about uh, uh, A, Turkish taxation, B, about the um, practice of uh, the child tribute, um, a number of sons from each village were usually taken into the core of Janus, Janissaries, the Turkish army, or um, the civil administration. But um, at various times, this is seen as um, irksome, and at uh, certain stages, I think it you know, sparks yeah. rebellion in particular places. But there are a whole series of aspects of arbitrary Turkish government that are highly unpopular. Um, so the uh, Greek rebels essentially are looking to ameliorate that, establish a degree of independence, not necessarily a Totally separate country, and, um, and so and so what? So, so so we we so, so one one gets to the point of independence. That, that of course there's the uh, where where uh, 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 Russia, uh, Britain uh, play substantial roles, don't they? I mean the 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 the, the, yes, so the battle do. of Navarino, the, the the sea battle is is uh, yes, it, is very I mean, much a battle of great powers against the Ottomans, isn't it? But yes, I think the way it starts out though is essentially a local revolt that um, actually the great powers view with considerable suspicion because uh, bear in mind that at this time um, Napoleon has just been defeated at Waterloo, there's the Congress of Vienna, uh, all the great powers of Europe essentially are trying to put the lid on any kind of uh, radical or liberal uh, or Republican sentiments. Uh, on the whole, they don't view with any sympathy the idea of uh, small people revolting against a great power. But what goes wrong in Greece is really that uh, initially the Greeks are a bit successful. Um, then the Sultan turns around, overreacts. Um, he can't actually do anything terribly effective himself. So he gets his um, Egyptian vassal, uh, Ibrahim, to come in with a, a large uh, army of uh, mercenaries, many of them uh, either Egyptians or Albanians. Um, and basically they behave extremely badly, particularly in the Peloponnese. There are you know, vast massacres. Um, the whole thing becomes a, an absolutely horrific um, situation with massacre, counter-massacre, atrocities, and basically the entire commerce of the Eastern Mediterranean is being disrupted. Um, uh, the Russians, who are you know, normally sort of pretty conservative in their attitude, uh, are horrified at what's happening to their co-religionists. The British and the French, who are essentially you know, conservative governments, um, you know, think the situation can't be tolerated. So the powers attempt to intervene, send their fleets into the Aegean, uh, there is a moment where, in fact, they clash with an Egyptian fleet at Navarino, and almost by accident, there's a huge naval battle. Um, the Egyptians are wiped out. 
uh, in effect by default. Um, the, the Greeks are able to um, take control, not of all Greece, but of the Peloponnese and the area immediately around them to the north of Athens, um, but going up perhaps uh, um, up towards uh, Thessaly, but not including Thessaly. So it's only about perhaps 30 to 40 percent of the current Greek state, perhaps slightly less. Yes, and in fact, one of the striking things is in the hundred years after uh, after independence, Greece actually increases its territory almost threefold, doesn't it? I mean, it it uh, it, it yes. yeah. So, so yeah. Uh, of course, it's a long, of, slow process. It, it's it's also the slow process of the disintegration of the Ottoman Empire, which uh, which Greece then is in a position to. Uh, to, to to fill out, and but we'll get on to of course what happens in 1920, which is uh, the end of that process. Um, so 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 the, the, so so, so the, but let, let me get back to the to the great powers because what so so, um, so there's a local revolt, but nevertheless, what happens after that is the establishment of this completely foreign monarchy, isn't it? I mean, what. Seems, seems yes, that's absolutely right. You have a brief period during which the powers are scratching their heads as to what to do, and the heroic Capodistrias tries in his rather bureaucratic way to bring order, to impose a sort of rule of law, um, express the brigands, get um, public works undertaken, repair the roads, collect taxes, and um, basically uh, all the people who fought in the War of Independence are quite unruly, many of them extremely ungrateful. Um, he quarrels with a man called, I think, Petrobre, uh, uh, Mavra Michaelis, who uh, murders him on his way to church. Um, so, <laughs> um, basically, uh, this, if you like, is the reasonable bureaucrat trying to persuade his countrymen to behave well, and they won't. And um, the powers effectively say, well, ooh, tut tut, these unruly people have to uh, have a, a monarch. It can't be anyone from Britain, France, or um, Britain, uh, sorry, Britain, uh, Russia, or France. And we'll rule ourselves out, but we'll pick somebody reasonably neutral. So they end up with um, a 17 year old um, Bavarian prince, um, who they call King Otto, who arrives um, in Athens, um, gradually learns to speak Greek. He's very charming um, and actually plays a bit of a dim lid. Um, he never seems to understand quite what's happening. Um, there are ever um, increasing sort of faction fights around him, which he tends to ignore. He promises to uh, rule by a liberal constitution, but in fact he never does. Yeah. Um, so effectively there's a kind of uh, despotism. Um, he brings his various and, Bavarian advisors along too, and, 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 about and, trying to uh, run the country effectively, and um, you know, largely um, do not succeed in doing so may, effectively. May, may, may be worth noting um, in, in the current context that, that um, I think it must be Otto's father uh, says, yes, well, you know, yes, we're quite happy to take on, you know, take on another... Another throne, uh, you know, we'll we'll do that. But but Greece is bankrupt. But but but, yes. but, but Greece is bankrupt, so. and you better lend us a good pot of money. So actually, the you know the Greek the Greek monarchy is born indebted and in hoc. There's a there's a there's a sale of bonds uh, in London to finance the to finance the Greek monarchy in 1832. That's absolutely right, and um, I think um, eventually um, quite a lot is spent. On the central infrastructure, and you know, essentially on providing, um, uh, as it were, uh, things to enhance the court of King Otto and his prestige, um, but uh, very little spent on the real sort of inf infrastructure of Greece. Uh, and eventually, that leads, of course, to a default. I think in um, 1843, um, and the consequence is that Greece is in fact cut out from the international financial markets. I think until 1878 or thereabouts, when uh, um, they're able to start lending again. Sorry, borrowing again from uh, overseas sources, and and yeah, yes, yes, and 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 that 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 this is uh, this is in a sense already part of Greece being placed within an international system, which in a sense no one has ever uh, asked Greeks to be yes, a part right. of. I think the, the, the Greeks find themselves, as well, slightly to their surprise, entirely free of the Turks, but uh, essentially having um, the, the country. Uh, run from afar by sort of occasional interventions from the so-called protecting powers, the Russians, the British and the French. Um, these protecting powers intervene from time to time um, to uh, constrain what Greece can do, notably during the Crimean War, when um, basically having propped up the Turkish Empire for some time, um, the Russians are then uh, uh, becoming increasingly sort of irritated with the Turks. They make a series of demands which the Turks resist. Um, uh, War breaks out between Turkey and Russia, Britain and France, or the Turks, um, against the Russians. Uh, the Greeks, of course, 
and sympathise with their um, co-religionists, the Russians, against the Turks, start raiding across the border. The British and French um, intervene and send in a small force to occupy Athens to sort of keep the Greeks in order. It's one of those situations oh. where the Greeks, you know, effectively are playing a cat and mouse game and um, teetering on the brink, not daring to actually um, come in with the Russians and fight the Turks because they know perfectly well that uh, they can't afford to break with Britain and France. Um, but that's fairly typical, I suppose, at the state of Greece during the 19th century. It can only go so far as a constant attempt to expand their territory right. and I, to take an anti-Turkish line, but their resources are very limited and they're not truly um, independent of the other big powers. And, and so, and so let, let's move on from there to the, uh, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the Balkan Wars of the early 20th century, because that's, the, in, in, in a sense, the continuation of, uh, of, of, the, of the disintegration of the Ottoman Empire, isn't it? And, and, and yes, that's right. I mean, there's, um, uh, shall we say, a sort of fairly key period in um, 1877, 1878, when there's another uh, major break with the Russians who uh, um, basically march on Constantinople, um, persuaded by the British, French, and ultimately the Germans under Bismarck, who act as honest brokers. Um, basically, the Ottomans uh, lose quite a lot of territory. Um, Serbia and Bulgaria, uh, small Serbia and Bulgarian states are created. Um, the, the Greeks get a little bit of uh, extra territory in um, Thessaly and central Greece, but essentially the Ottoman Empire is propped up in uh, the, the middle of the Balkans in uh, part of Bulgaria, Serbia, Macedonia, Albania, um, to struggle on for a bit longer. And it's fairly evident to everybody that uh, the Turkish Empire is uh, crumbling. It's the, the sick man of Europe. Um, but for various reasons, the powers are quite anxious to keep it in being. They don't like the idea of the Russians seizing Constantinople, um, anxious about any other power um, becoming too dominant in that part of the world. So by mutual agreement, it's propped up. The Greeks are quite anxious to complete what they describe as their big idea, the megali idea of ultimately recovering all Greek-speaking territory, perhaps extending as far as Constantinople or taking in the Greeks in Anatolia. But they can only do this very gradually. Although there's, there's, there are separate Bulgarian nationalist movements at this time who are also taking advantage of the... I mean, there, there are nationalist yeah. movements all over the Balkans, really, taking uh, with their own, their own designs, as it were, on, on the space left by the, uh, uh, by the, Turks. the crumbling Turks. Absolutely right. So uh, there are a series of sort of conflicts. In fact, the, the, nation, the various Christian nationalisms are often in conflict with each other. I mean, the, the Turks and the Serbs have an observed... Ah, uh, um, uh, Terence, I think you cut out. You cut out on this, and I, I, I do think it's worth going back. So I think you cut out around the time when uh, we were talking about about the various Balkan nationalisms that were that were uh, looking for uh, yes. a space to occupy in the wake of the Ottoman retreat. Yes, so um, uh, after eighteen seventy eight, you uh, have a slightly expanded Greece. You have an independent Romania. Um, you have a, a smallish Bulgaria and a smallish Serbia, uh, and there's quite a lot of um, territory in the middle of the Balkans still under Turkish rule, imminently expected as a way that Turkish rule will collapse and there will be um, you know, some form of... And how much, how much this, this, becomes, this becomes a striking feature of the 20th century, how much population movement is there uh, at this point? I mean, when, when do these nationalisms drive out Muslim uh, population. No, I, I don't think they do, because I think the Muslim population um, largely remains, um, I mean, in places like Bosnia, which was under uh, Austrian rule from 1878, um, and in much of the um, area known as Macedonia or um, southern Bulgaria, there are still quite uh, substantial Muslim populations. And in Albania, of course, yes. Uh, Al Albania, uh, many of the population uh, of the uh, Albanian population, as it were, converted to Islam, as it were, quite considerably further back, and there are uh, Muslim populations in northern Greece. There is some controversy over whether these people are actually ethnic Turks or uh, uh, whether they're uh, you know, Greeks or Macedonians who've embraced Islam. Uh, nobody quite agrees. And, over and this. Uh, we do. Are you really you uh, uh, this notion of? I mean, presumably the ethnicity of the whole region must be an extreme. I mean, what what exactly does that mean? It sounds very vexed. I mean, it sounds as if the ethnicity of the region must be really very very. It's undefinable. Very indeed, basically. Um, I mean, I think many uh, people will be well aware that Macedonia as it were, has been a conceptual can of worms and um, you know, battle um, among the Balkan people for a, a long time. Um, there is currently a former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia, which essentially is a, a, a Slav state and it speaks a language that 
that's, um, shall we say, related to um, Serbian and Bulgarian. Um, Bulgarians often regard the Macedonians as part of Bulgaria. The Serbs have in the past regarded the Macedonians as part of Serbia. Um, the Greeks often take the view that um, essentially the Macedonians are a kind of um, a subspecies of uh, Greece, or if they're not, they want to very clearly separate the Macedonians um, from the Greek population in northern Greece along the current Macedonian border um, and try and make sure that uh, uh, various Macedonian symbols are appropriate to Greece rather than being used by what they see as his Of course, and, 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 and recently we've seen the unedifying spectacle of the Greek extreme right party Golden Dawn uh, think you know, trying to claim in the midst of this crisis that actually the status of Macedonia and Macedonia's application to EU membership is the most important issue that needs to be faced. That's right. It, it, it may seem quite extraordinary in the current context that people feel as it were so violently about a, a small labour, but all of this does go back, as it were, through a very tortured history um, in the Balkans, where there's been a great deal of bloodshed and a huge amount of. Uh, um, competing nationalist claims and um, you know, a whole series of uh, wars, uh, obviously, which have cost all these countries um, very dear, and it's an ingrained part of the national consciousness. People find it very difficult to, uh, um, as it were, forgive and let go of these claims, unfortunately. So it's these wars, of course, these Balkan wars, uh, of course, sort of, in a sense, merge into uh, the First World War, don't they? Yes. Just looking at very briefly on the Balkan wars, what happens is that um, the process of Turkish breakdown really starts with an attempt to reform the Turkish Empire by young Turkish officers seizing power in 1908 and trying to reform the, uh, as it were, the uh, collapsing uh, caliphate. The young uh, Turks, that yes. Spurred the, the young Turks, exactly. Um, uh, that spurs the Italians to have a go at seizing Libya and then the Dodecanese Islands, notably Rhodes, um, which the Turks had defeated. The Balkan nations then realise that the Turkey is really sort of on the point of imploding, um, and uh, the Greeks get together with the uh, uh, Bulgarians, the Serbs, the Montenegrins to launch a coordinated attack on the Turks, which almost drives the Turks entirely out of Europe. But the Bulgarians almost capture Constantinople, uh, and then, of course, having defeated the Turks, they turn on each other. Um, uh, there's a huge uh, fight about the spoils of you know, the Greeks and the Serbs and the Romanians gang up on the Bulgarians or vice versa. But anyway, there's a war between those parties. Um, so you have two uh, fairly savage little wars in the Balkans, 1912 to uh, 1913, um, before you get to the First World War. Um, so the background of the First World War is you have um, a Serbian state that's done quite well um, in its recent fights in the Balkans. But one thing it's not very happy about is that the Austrians have... Uh, intervened to create an independent Albania, blocking Serbia's access to the sea. So very, very strained relations between Serbia and um, the Austro-Hungarian monarchy, disputes about the, um, uh, shall we say, the future of Bosnia-Herzegovina. Um, Serbs regard this as their um, territory. The many Muslim inhabitants of um, Bosnia are um, determined not to be right, incorporated and, into which had been on, Which is Austro-Hungarian, yes. And, and the rest, as they say, is history. Um, basically, the the Russians um, you know, see um, the Austrian attempt to crush Serbia um, as uh, an affront to them and to their ambitions, and um, things essentially, I think, um, go out of control. The Germans effectively allow the Austrians to um, uh, go far further than uh, historically the, the Germans have normally attempted to preserve peace between Austria and Russia. I think that they thought that they could... Um, win a war quickly. I, I won't go into this to the First no, World War, but no. by accident you have... <laughs> Not this uh, time, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> the First World War um, suddenly coming out of um, the blue for uh, most people. Obviously, as far as the Balkans and Greece... But, yes, so, from, from uh, Greece's point of view, the First World War, so we have the, we have a king who at this point is not a Bavarian king anymore. Is that right? He's a, yeah, that's absolutely right, because I'm afraid the Bulgarian, he didn't, um, King Otto, uh, he didn't have a successor, and he wasn't um, minded to stick to constitutions. He got overthrown in 1862, um, and then they scratched their heads and thought, well, we need another monarch, and they hunted around. They actually wanted to have one of Queen Victoria's sons, Prince Alfred, but were told that the, you know, the British should rule themselves out in this particular game. So they ended up with a Danish dynasty and had the... Um, um, the second son of the Danish monarch instead. This was King George I, who ruled actually considerably more successfully. He was um, quite a shrewd individual. He allowed constitutional politics to operate, although extremely unstable. Um, and uh, you know, effectively, he was um, you know, managing to act as the, uh, the figurehead and behind 
and the scene's mastermind of Green Hawk Dixbury successfully until 1913 when he was murdered by a mad anarchist and his son, um, King Constantine I, was rather less adroit. Um, the problem was essentially that as soon as the First World War started, Greece was rather torn in its loyalties, their natural sympathies with their co-religionists, the Serbs, who were rapidly defeated by the Austrians. Um, they uh, also sympathised essentially with Orthodox Russia, um, or minded as well to uh, you know, support the, um, the, the French and the British, their traditional co-protectors. On the other hand, King Constantine was the brother-in-law of um, Kaiser William. He and many of um, I suppose the upper classes in Greece actually believed that German victory was fairly inevitable. So there was both a strong pro-German faction centred around the monarch um, and a quite strongly pro-allied faction around a, a remarkable um, Cretan politician called um, Eleftherios Venizelos. Is, is he, by the way, so Venizelos is also uh, the name of the current leader of PASOK. Are, the, are they by any chance related, uh, as, as can happen in Greek politics? It seems that probably they're not. Um, there is some suggestion that uh, Evangelos Venizelos, as it were, simply adopted the name. Uh, I don't know how true this okay. is about them to say, but it appears that there is uh, uh, no obvious or close relationship. Okay, okay. okay. It's, it's, it's like having lots of, there, there are lots of, there, there are lots of yeah. smiths. And, I think um, it was a, a, a Sophocles Venizelos who was quite important. Right. Uh, okay. So, so we don't we don't have an example of dynastic politics uh, here yet. I think it's a slightly. Uh, we haven't quite got onto that. No. But no. I think. Um, <laughs> um, so uh, the the great Venizelos was um, originally a Cretan who became, um, uh, shall we say, uh, was invited in effectively to try and deal with the Cretan problem and um, was prime minister um, during the First World War. But um, there was something of a national schism at that point. Uh, basically, that is what eventually had to oh, about the about whose side, government. about who to support, well, on which, which side to yes, support yes, in the world in the first very world war. Strange situation where the, the British and the French effectively moved against Bulgaria, which was allied to Germany, and they moved against it through Salonika. So effectively, they took over Salonika by force, and Greece was still neutral, um, and uh, tried to tie down a Bulgarian army and tried to. Uh, you know, effectively uh, outflank the, the Turks, um, but without uh, Greece being actually committed. Um, uh, the Greeks, obviously, under um, you know, part of the country under Venizelos, actually wanted to uh, uh, fight Bulgaria. Um, there was a, a horrendous situation when the Bulgarians um, took a particular Greek fort called Rupel, and uh, some of the officers were ordered, I think, effectively by the uh, royalist officers to surrender this fort. And, and is this is this division is this is this division the same? Does it overlap a royalist versus republican division? Is Venizelos? Uh, yes, I mean, uh, uh, there has been a, a royalist republican division, perhaps for uh, some time. It becomes vastly more acute at this particular point, um, where the monarchists see perhaps as being you know, essentially more tied to the um, urban elite. Um, the Republicans, perhaps more rural, um, the islands, Crete, etc. There's a um, distinct um, suspicion of the monarchy as being essentially, um, uh, shall I say, sort of corrupt and elitist, indifferent to the ordinary people. And, and, and that and that cleavage is the same as the as the uh, uh, um, German uh, versus uh, German Ottoman. Uh, yes, I think it uh, eventually gets overlaid. Effectively, the two. Um, issues sort of run into each other and uh, in the heat of the First World War, in the heat of the situation where effectively Venizelos is proclaiming a uh, sort of one government uh, in favour of the allies in Salonika, while the king and his um, uh, military and uh, civil officials are still uh, running Athens and the area around it, um, there is effectively almost a kind of um, civil war. There's no right. very serious fighting, but right. there's a, 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 a schism, a schism authority. Right. Right. Uh, and eventually the British and French effectively intervene, um, force the king to um, uh, leave Greece, and Venizelos effectively takes control. This is something that all Greeks agree with. There are many people who are anti venizelist in um, Athens, but um, uh, effectively the pro-Allied party uh, wins. And, and what, there's a new, is there a new constitution, or is there just a, a constitutional yes, monarchy I mean, without a monarch? What's the... Well, we have a very tangled situation for a while. While the monarchy continues in exile and the Venezuelists effectively control Greece, um, so there's a kind of breakdown of clear authority. Um, I think Greece remains a monarchy until 1924. What actually happens is that Venizelos um, 
uh, effectively takes Greece into the Allied side of World War One. And and and, 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 and and this crucial thing gets gets an extremely good settlement at at Versailles. Yes, he gets a very good settlement. He gets um, as well all the territory that uh, Greece had um, after the Second Balkan War. So he gets the territory that was taken from Bulgaria. He actually gets slightly more. He gets the uh, whole Aegean coastline. Um, and he's also promised, effectively, by the um, uh, Treaty of Sèvres, um, territory in um, what had been um, Ottoman Turkey. So there's effectively a promise of um, territory around Smyrna and um, in European Turkey. Um, the trouble is that this effectively has to be enforced by the Greeks themselves. The uh, Western Allies aren't prepared, effectively, to send um, forces into Anatolia. Well, so, and Sèvres is the same... Tra- I mean, Sèvres is a, is a, is a treaty which... Um Sèvres Treaty, which didn't work, isn't it? It's the one that gave Kurds also a promise of a homeland, wasn't it, as part of the carve-up of the Ottoman right. Empire? That's right. The, Italians, that's right. The, the Italians have been promised some territory which conflicts with uh, what Greece has been promised. Effectively, um, Venezuelos is left to make good Greece's own territorial demands, but without the backing of the Western powers. Right. And, um, uh, but the Sultan yeah. signs it. The Sultan agrees. Um, the Sultan is sort of at this stage, you know, more or less powerless and forced yeah. to accept the situation. So um, the Turks are kind of on their knees at the end of the First World War, their entire empire disintegrating. Um, and there's a slightly complicated situation where eventually power passes to a group of uh, uh, nationalist officers with a rather um, secular nationalistic agenda under Kemal oh. Ataturk. Um, and, and, and indeed, and indeed, Ataturk's. Uh, a- a- Ataturk, the, the, the takeover by Ataturk is, in fact, to some extent, precipitated, isn't it, by the conce- by these concessions that Venezuelos yes, it, it, has 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 extracted. I mean, it, it's such a it's such an affront. It, it's a fairly devastating um, prospect, I think, for the Turks that uh, a substantial part of the most prosperous part of their country is going to be um, taken by um, the, the Greeks, a uh, you know, foreign and um, Islamic. And so, and so, and so, that nationalist fire is lit in a sense by exactly. uh, yes, the Ottoman but, Empire, having essentially been a fairly uh, uh, cosmopolitan and um, transnational organisation, although effectively dominated by the Turks, um, becomes far more um, explicitly a Turkish national state. Um, there is a clear conflict that erupts about well, where exactly is the national boundary between the Greeks and the Turks. Um, Kamal Ataturk is determined effectively that the whole of Anatolia, or at least the mainland, is going to be Turkish, resists the Greek incursion inland. Um, Which has been promised to, to the Greeks by, Se- by the Treaty of Sèvres, and so we get this appalling war and this, this, this terrible... So there's um, uh, a fairly bloody war. Um, uh, I think, uh, basically, Venizelos is not effectively able to organise. I think at this particular point there is some disruption in the... Uh, Greek uh, political process where Venezuela is sort of out of power and not able to coordinate matters. Um, there is some degree, shall we say, of sort of uh, uh, failure of organisation on the Greek part. Uh, anyway, their military expedition is defeated very badly by Kemal Ataturk. The Greeks uh, are completely defeated and the Turks um, take back all of mainland Anatolia, uh, drive the Greek population from um, what is now Izmir. And ultimately, there's an agreement between the uh, two governments that there will be an exchange of populations. And this is the, this is the, what what we would today call ethnic an, an agreement to ethnically cleanse. Yes, in effect, it's an agreement to uh, ethnically cleanse. It's probably somewhat somewhat more thorough on the um, Turkish side, um, but I think given that the war had been fairly bloody, obviously those Greeks remaining behind are very frightened of what the Turks. And the number, I mean, the numbers are, st- are staggering, aren't they? One point four million Greeks leave. Yes, something or, like that. And, and, uh, and four hundred thousand Turks leave that's Greece. That's I mean, that's right. And a, a very large number of Turks leave Greece. There are substantial numbers of um, uh, Muslims in uh, Crete, in some of the Aegean islands, and also in the north in Macedonia and uh, all communities scattered around. So there's a, a substantial departure of uh, either ethnically Turkish or, uh, shall we say, non-Christian um, population from uh, Greece heading uh, in the direction of Turkey. And that one point, and and, and again, that one point four million—that's about a third. What is it? A quarter of the population? A fifth it, of the it population? Could be a quarter of the population. Um, so, so that's a huge transfer of population. Um, people who come, not entirely, you know, many of them uh, bring quite substantial assets and skills. Obviously, um, uh, they can't necessarily bring everything with them. But there's probably quite an influx of uh, um, uh, 
money, um, artisans, and traders, etc. But 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 presumably also some 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 sort of deeply rural populations as well uh, in that number. Or was it mainly yes, urban? Certainly, that's right. Um, I think it was quite a mix, yes. and I think there were some quite valuable things that came. I mean, particularly the uh, modern tobacco industry that had largely been around um, uh, Smyrna. Um, so quite a lot of um, expertise in tobacco cultivation that arrives in Greece, and you have tobacco for the most time becoming a quite substantial Greek export. And um, in the 1920s and 30s, there's a you know, developing barter trade, and particularly with Germany, which then starts to take a substantial chunk of the um, Greek tobacco exports. That's a, a useful earner. So there are certainly sort of positive aspects, but it must have been extremely disruptive at the time to have this huge exchange of populations. And, and, and also so, presumably culturally uh, uh, creating a sense, uh, uh, you know, exiled populations yes. have a sense uh, of, of, of returning home and, and of not being, of wanting to return home. I mean, I was very struck visiting the Prince's Islands off, off Istanbul, um, which had been islands that had been uh, uh, apparently largely used by uh, uh, Greek traders as summer homes. And there's a there's a strong sense there that there's obviously in recently been been money put into uh, re- into memory into remembering this, and there's a strong sense of a um, of of the the longing of the Greeks who'd been moved in the 1920s to return uh, uh, to return to their homes. So 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 it must be, it's quite something to have a quarter of your population having at least some of those that sense that sense of uh, of, of of longing to return. I think this undoubtedly must be the case. Um, what one suspects is that with the passage of uh, 90 years, is obviously the memory is now um, fading. I think the, um, shall we say, the uh, residual uh, bitterness about what happened probably um, is rather ingrained whether anybody actually practically thinks yes. that um, any likelihood of Greek population return is unlikely. Um, the trouble is that um, there are a whole series of issues that have um, continued to embitter relations. But what we then get is, 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 is an extremely, and we'll get onto this, but this very, very unstable 20s, 30s, 40s in Greece, when that must have been much, much more present uh, as, a, as, a, as a reality. <laughs> That's absolutely right. And what you have, undoubtedly, is for the first time probably a rather um, large um, impoverished and uh, dissatisfied urban population and you certainly get the beginnings of uh, um, both a sort of socialist and uh, ultimately a a strong communist movement, the uh, uh, KKE, the um, Greek Communist Party, which for the first time begins to make electoral um, advances in the 1920s and it becomes a significant force in the 30s and even more in the 40s. Yes, and, and again and, and again today as, we've, as, 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 we, see, as today, we see. Yes. Now, Terence, we've, this has been fantastic. We've gone on an hour. I need to leave, which is a very, which is great pity, but it seems to me we've got to a very good point because, uh, you know, that, that, that the, the end of the war uh, uh, and, and, and that great movement of populations of the 1920s, it seems to me, sets us up for the next piece, and I think we need another hour, um, which I can't give you now. Um, Tony, it would be a pleasure to do it to, to some other more convenient moment, but um, this has been uh, very enjoyable and interesting for me, and uh, I hope other people have uh, uh, at least uh, thought about some of the issues or been uh, a little entertained by what we've been saying, but it would be very good to resume this at a more convenient moment, Tony. Fantastic, and uh, thank you very much. And 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 we will definitely do the next chapter because it, it seems to me that there's a we 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 need to get to the elections which are happening at the, at the end of this Box week up. is it yes yes yes, yes. A, a fascinating story very good Terence thank, thank you very well, much I'll speak to you soon speak, speak to you thank soon you. goodbye.